Welcome to the first episode of Season 2 of Sharing Life Lessons. I am your host Hamida and I want to bring you stories because stories inspire, stories teach and stories heal. I can't tell you how happy I am to be back with my listeners. I finished episode one by publishing 10 episodes and it was a wonderful journey. I also finished season one with over 2000 plays. To me, that's amazing. And for that, I have to thank a few people. So here are my thank yous. Thank you to those who listened to season one, to my true supporters who signed up for monthly subscriptions, and to the guests who were just interesting and intriguing people and honored me by being on my show. And here I am with season two. Like every producer who wants to produce a sequel for their movie, I started planning for my season two. And the big question was, is this format working or should I be changing it? And so I asked all my friends, I asked my family, I also reached out to listeners who normally interact with me and my critics, I asked them as well. So here is what I asked my critic. Now, what about season two? I wrote to him, what changes to bring? I want to uh, enhance season two as a better version of season one. And this was his response. Don't do this to yourself. If I was in your place, I would concentrate on the fun that I'm going to have listening to other people's stories. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Everyone told me this format is fine, and so I am going to stick to it. But for episode one of season two, I'm going to be doing this a little differently. Of course, I want to cover COVID-19, but from a different perspective and from a very positive angle. Therefore, I am calling this episode Finding the Calm in the Chaos. Here is the story that inspired this theme. I watch uh, ABC News at 6.30 every day with David Muir. And on April 24th, this is the story that he aired. Nurse Lisa, who treats COVID patients in a New Jersey hospital, learned of the condition of an 82-year-old called Marie from a family member. It seems like Marie was not being taken to the hospital uh, because the EMT determined that she was doing fine in that state. So she decided to help by driving across states. She drove to Marie's house, taping garbage bags to her passenger seat and wearing full protective gear. When she arrived at the apartment, Marie could barely breathe. When they got to Lisa's hospital ER, there was a team waiting for Marie. After one week at the hospital, Marie was discharged to a rehab unit. Marie says Lisa and her team give her nothing but hope and love. Lisa was happy that Marie had a great outcome, and Marie's daughter Donna was extremely grateful to Lisa and called her their family's earth angel for saving her mother's life. Now, isn't this a beautiful story, and isn't this the positive side of COVID-19? Well, this is what I'm talking about. Like my mom used to say, after every night comes day, And if you do not experience the darkness, you will never value the light. You will agree there are many such miracle workers all around the world. And today we have with us one such miracle worker. Everyone, let's welcome Rachna Johari. Rachna is a nurse in a COVID unit in a hospital in New Jersey. And talking to her, I am sure will help us find that calm in the chaos. Welcome, Rachna. Can you please tell us something about yourself? And also, what's your story? Thank you, Hamida. It's my pleasure. So my name is Rachna Johari, and uh, I received my uh, nursing training and education at St. Mary's Hospital, uh, a Mayo Foundation Institute, back in 1990s. So I have been in this nursing field for almost 30 years. Uh, Currently, I'm working at Central State Medical Center in Freehold, New Jersey, and I essentially work on a medical surgical unit that specializes in general surgery and bariatric surgery. Um, Unfortunately, um, all of the hospital units were converted to a COVID unit because we had a big surge of uh, COVID patients coming in starting first week of March. 
Um, the, the biggest volume that we saw coming in was in the second week of March. And since then, it has been a pretty steady flow. However, in the last one week, um, the, the curve has started to go plateau. It has not bent just yet, but it is plateauing. Um, there are lesser admissions that I see coming in. And the more critical patients that we had in the unit and the CCU who were intubated and were on the ventilator are improving. They have been extubated. They have been put, to, put on the regular units now. And uh, so, yeah, there is a ray of hope we see with these patients. And uh, in the oncoming days, hopefully the curve will bend. And it will therefore mean that we are um, winning over COVID. Thank you for showing us that spark of hope. Before we go anywhere with this, I want to ask you an important question. You have been physically dealing with the worst of the situation, and you've seen it all. I want to ask you, how are you doing? How are you and your colleagues dealing with this emotionally? Emotionally, I think uh, we, are, we are handling ourselves well because we have a lot of... Um, um, support from each other. When we say each other, meaning the colleagues. Some of us have worked with each other for almost 20 years. I've been working on this unit for, this is my 20th year, and some of us have been there for 20 plus years. So we were always a very close unit, but what I have now seen is uh, from other units, because when we have uh, lesser patients, so to speak, then we flow to different units. And it's become a one big team. It's just not, I work on a unit called Four North. Sometimes I have to work on a different unit called Four East. So now this whole unit has combined into one big unit, not just segmented different units. So we do derive a lot of strength from each other. There are times when one patient, one nurse's patient goes, goes bad. So we as a team, you know, work towards getting that patient timely, um, you know, whatever intervention is needed, whether that patient needs to be intubated right on the unit and be transferred to CCU, or we first get that patient to CCU and then take care of the interventions. So yes, we have derived a lot of strength and we've, we've formed a closer bond with each other. We also have a team of um, uh, a pastor, from different faiths. Unfortunately, those, there's nobody from the Hindu religion or the Islam, but there is from um, different Christian parishes. They come in and they, they speak to us one-on-one -on -one sometimes, and they do give us a lot of strength. Nothing to do with religion, it's just humane. And that goes a long way too, and some of our doctors are amazing. Like I said, you know, we've been working together for 20 years, so we support each other. So I think they're hanging in there. It's physical fatigue more than emotional fatigue at this point in time. It's good to know that you're surrounded with so much support, and I'm wishing that every healthcare provider out there is also surrounded with the same kind of support. We've also been seeing in media how um, there are those patients that coming that are coming off ventilators, how all the nurses get together and cheer them, and then there are also some uh, healthcare providers and nurses who who said that they get emotionally attached to the patients because their families are not around them to take care of them. Did you have you experienced any such thing? Oh yes. Most of our uh, patients, not just the ones who are coming off CCU being extubated. Um, I'll tell you something very recent, uh, recent that happened. I was actually telling my children this the other day that uh, when I worked last on Friday, there was this uh, patient who, a Latin American patient who kept asking me, um, he asked me, are you short of staff today? So I asked him, why you ask that? He said, because I've been seeing you coming in every few minutes. So why do you keep coming in? Um, don't you send the technicians in because they're supposed to do what you are doing? I said, no, you know, we all work together. So he said, you know, he's not supposed to touch the nurse. So he says, I wish I could hug you and tell you that you are like my daughter. He was a senior person. 
So, and I said, you know what? I have been looking up to you as my dad. That's why I keep coming to checking up on you. So there is, yes, you know, there is this bond that forms between patients. We get patients who don't even speak a word of English, yet they are able to communicate with us. So yeah, we are family away from family for to them at the at, at this point in time. It's true. You're playing multiple roles here. You're, you're not only their healthcare providers at this point in time, but you're also playing the role of their families because their families cannot be with them in, under these circumstances. And because you're doing so much, I know it's only been a couple of months, but does it seem like a lifetime to you, just like it seems a, a lifetime to some of us? It is. It's actually the, the seventh week now going into... Um, a full quarantine unit and um, I cannot say the amount of appreciation I have seen so it makes me feel good that I am in I am just doing my job as they say I don't see myself as a hero I don't uh, see see myself as God sent person I am just a nurse or just a person who's here to help somebody uh, who I would have normally done that It's not something out of the ordinary that we are doing. But one thing I have learned for sure is how to fight fear from my patients because these patients are quarantined. They are in one small room. The door is closed all the time. There is nobody to, you know, we do interact with them through intercom because you're not allowed to go in multiple times a day unless absolutely necessary. And some of these patients, are, you know, especially our elderly patients, they are not tech savvy. So they, have, they cannot FaceTime their families or they cannot text their families or you know, they can't even speak with their families very frequently. So it's a fearful factor because all of us know that there is no cure for this virus just yet and there is no vaccine. And they watch TV and while they're watching TV, every single station you watch at every single channel is only talking about morosity yeah morbidity death pain suffering so they're scared they're very scared and my job is to tell them not to be scared not to be fearful which i don't think i had ever done that in my 30 years of nursing almost never so that's one thing i have learned is myself not to be fearful in order to teach other people not to be scared. This is the perfect example of finding the calm in the chaos. From all of the chaos that the media is bringing into the lives of the patients at the most critical juncture of their lives, it is you and your colleagues that are presenting the much needed calm to them. And for that, we really appreciate you. Please tell us if there is any overarching life lesson that you've learned out of this entire experience and if there is a final message you want to give to the listeners i would just say have faith in god number one if you if you believe in a higher power and the other is don't um don't be scared of something that you don't know i know it's easier said than done and believe in yourself believe in yourself trust in your um, in, in your provider, whether it's your doctor or your nurse. That's all yep. I can say. That's very important. And that's a good message. Trust your providers, because as we are hearing right now, all of you mm-hmm. have just goodness in your hearts and you all want to do the right thing for every single patient. Rachna, I want to extend my gratitude to you for doing everything that you're doing. I also want to convey my best wishes for your health and safety And again, I want to thank you for being on the show with me today. Thank you very much. I hope our discussion with Rachna gave you an insight on what the frontliners do, how they feel, and how they're coping with this situation. Moving on to our next segment, I did tell you in the beginning of the show that this was going to be a little different. And being that this is a global pandemic, I want to bring you global perspectives of how the pandemic is playing out in other parts of the world. And also staying with my theme about finding calm within the chaos, I asked the the guests from other countries and we have a guest from London, we have a guest from Canada, and we also have a guest from New Zealand. 
So I thought that was pretty diverse. Uh, and I asked them three questions. I asked them to introduce themselves. I asked them, how are you feeling about the COVID-19 situation right now? And I also asked them to give us some good news about COVID, about the COVID-19 situation in their own countries. And they unanimously agreed that there was a better side of COVID. But what that better side meant to each one of them was very different. And they all three had their, uh, had their unique perspectives on that. So uh, let's listen to Paul Howden. Paul Howden is from London. Hello from London. And hi, Hamida. Thank you very much for inviting me to contribute to your podcast. Uh, I say I'm reporting from London. I'm actually sitting in the family home in Kent, which is in southeast England. Uh, We live in a small village, very small village, which is very rural, very green. Right now, I am somewhere between super scared and super fascinated about COVID-19. And somewhere in the middle of that, I'm also super inspired. Just about covers where I am at the moment. When I'm able to put the reality and the seriousness of the situation to one side, and of course not ignoring the terrible hardship, grief and uh, discomfort that so many people are having to deal with. Beyond that, it's a very, very interesting and cultural moment in the history of the world. And it's just occasionally I like to take a moment to think about our place in that. In the United Kingdom, we had already been dealing with what I thought would be the biggest social and cultural earthquake that I would see in my lifetime, which was Brexit. Depth of feeling around Brexit had been very strong on all t- on all sides, and it had it had split families, it had split friends, it had uh, it had become a very very uncomfortable moment, and it had gone on for a long period of time. And I was really really worried about where that would leave us. And ironically, the very month that Brexit was confirmed in January, COVID-19 arrived on our shores. And not only has it completely obliterated and uh, any issues, any residual issues that arise from Brexit, people are not thinking about those now. What I actually notice is it seems to be even healing our country. It's, it's the weirdest thing to say about such a terrible thing. But it seems to be resolving and repairing all of the issues that we had as a result of the Brexit process. Um, And I see less anger and selfishness and more caring and selflessness in our society now. I'm of course fascinated as to what will come next. It's very unpredictable. I've no idea where we're going and when it will finish and where it will leave us. I try very hard not to think about the negative consequences. There could be massive changes in the world. The global economy and global politics, we could end up in a recession. It could affect industry. And on a personal level, I'm sure that our priorities will change, my priorities will change, and the things that I thought were important to me three or four months ago, I think I'll see in a different way now. I've noticed that I can do quite well without travelling and uh, without going to the shops and without sport and the other things that I thought were important to me. I also find it interesting to read that massive reductions in car and air travel and industry are slowing down the aspects of pollution that we're affecting global warming starting to even reverse that which is a really odd thing but again it's another it's another different way of looking at the at the virus yes i see plenty of very positive things about the situation if they're there if you can look for them um i can see it very closely in social media feeds where anger and resentment has been replaced by humor and support maybe my my uh, social media feeds are d- were different, but certainly before this started, that wasn't always the case. There was a lot of uh, anger there. This really has brought out the very best in our society. And what I'm interested in is that's that's driven by people themselves. That's not the government are telling us to do that, or the papers are telling us to do that, or anything. Was celebrities. I think people have people are very, very quickly made up their own minds about how they're going to deal with this and what's important to them. And what seems to be most important is the key human instinct, which is to care and not to destroy. And I've really enjoyed seeing so many stories every day of courage, resolve, industry and ingenuity and people making the best of a bad situation. And on that note, I wanted to uh, tell you about a guy that if you're not living in the United Kingdom, you may not have heard about it, but in the United Kingdom he's become instantly very famous. His name is Captain Tom Moore. Tom Moore. 
He's a World War II war veteran. And less than three weeks ago, on the 6th of April, uh, he was in his last month uh, as a 99-year-old. His 100th birthday is this week coming. And he started a Just Giving appeal to raise funds for our National Health Service to support the thousands of frontline doctors and nurses who were putting their lives at risk to help and save us. And he set himself a target of a thousand pounds um, and in return for that he was offering to walk 100 laps around his garden uh, aided only with his walking frame. And I think the total walk was going to amount to something like two and a half kilometres. As I record this it is now less than three weeks since that appeal started and Captain Tom has done the walk but his appeal something quite remarkable happened there. It ended up raising £29 million from that initial target of £1,000. He is prime time news on every newspaper and every news channel in the, in the land every day. As I said, his birthday, his 100th birthday is actually this week. Uh, when he finished the walk last week, he recorded a duet, if you can believe this, of uh, You'll Never Walk Alone with the NHS Voices of Care Choir. And last night it was announced that that had hit the top of the United Kingdom singles charts, making him the oldest UK singles chart topper in history at 99. It also means that the single will be the top of the charts this week when he hits 100. Can you imagine that? You live for 100 years, you've already served your country, and then suddenly you achieve all of that, and it shows what can be done in any adversity by anybody of any age. And actually, I've told you that story. I'm not sure I've, I'm not sure I've contributed to his appeal myself yet. So maybe I haven't quite realigned my, prop, my own priorities properly, but I will get there. It would also be useful for me to walk two and a half kilometres at this point in my life, but that's a whole different story. Anyway, if you want to learn more about that story, just Google Captain Tom Moore, and you will see there is plenty to read about. I hope you enjoy it. Well, Hamida, that's it from me. Good luck with season two of your Sharing Life Stories podcast, and thanks once again for inviting me to contribute. Thank you, Paul, for bringing us that really heartwarming story. I am not surprised that Captain Tom is the new hero in UK. He did so well for the NHS workers, and that's proof that the good happens to the good because now he is he broke the record and on his 100th birthday is on the top of the UK singles chart. That is a, a I love this story. But listeners, as you see, Paul found the better out of the situation or the calm within the chaos from the common people coming together in his country. <clears throat> he said it's not the politicians, it's not the, uh, the celebrities, but it's really the common folks. And so now let's move on to Canada and see what Fozia tells us is the better side of COVID-19 in Canada. Hello from Canada. My name is Fazia Hamani Madani. I work in the international development sector and I live in Toronto with my mom, my husband and our dog child circuit. I like how you framed the question as right now. The COVID-19 feeling has certainly been very iterative and fluid. So right at this time, I feel more settled than I did when the city initially shut down. But I have to admit, this feeling goes in ebbs and flows. Sometimes it's about how I am feeling, and sometimes it's about how I'm feeling as a result of what others are feeling. Um, so it's important for me to accept and respect that this keeps evolving and keeps changing. I also recognize that for some, this journey may be flipped where they are finding it harder with each passing day. Um, if I look back, drawing from the puns of perfect vision, uh, as we did at the end of 2019, I feel in a way 2020 has truly lived up to being a milestone year of clarity that many commented, uh, or in the spirit of more puns, envisioned it would be. Uh, so of course, we didn't see this coming, but it certainly made us all pause adapt and recalibrate. Uh, so yes, recalibrate really seems to be the central theme of it all for me. I'm a firm believer that sometimes 
bad things paved the way for some good things. Uh, I am absolutely not discounting the immense challenges this wave is bringing for everyone, but there are definitely some beautiful things that are coming out of this. Since this pandemic is a common denominator for all of us, locally and globally, I am overwhelmed by the sense of community it is binding us with. And that part is beautiful because it has somehow, just somehow brought us all to our basics, to be present, to connect as humans, to be kind to others, but also importantly to ourselves, to pause from the hustle, to be okay with not being productive and also not to feel pressured to feel product, to be productive. Um, during this time, I have indulged in some live sessions with my favorite artists that I otherwise would not have had the opportunity to do so. Uh, I'm learning how to drive. I'm learning how to repair my bike. Um, as a family, we are finding innovative and engaging ways to be together. So if there's one time the power of technology is coming through, uh, it, it truly is now. It's teaching us that distance does not make us distant. Thank you, Fosia, for contributing to this episode. Fosia from Canada found her calm within this chaos from a sense of community, from returning to the basics, and also from being able to spend the quality time that she otherwise would not be have been able to spend, and from developing skills and doing those things that she always wanted to do but never found the time to. Let's go to Shahina from New Zealand and let's see where her calm from the chaos came from. Kia ora from New Zealand. I'm Shahina Oberoi, a real estate agent based in Auckland. This is about COVID-19 and New Zealand. Never thought I'd experience anything like this in my lifetime, but mighty glad I am in New Zealand while doing so. All eyes are on us right now and how New Zealand has handled the virus, not only in flattening the curve, but in trying to totally eliminate it. We are a nation of 5 million people, and as of right now, which is the 28th of Feb, we've got 1,472 recorded numbers and 19 deaths, which is a fantastic outcome. I'll give you a quick timeline. On the 3rd of Feb, restrictions were put in place for all foreign nationals arriving or passing through China. On the 28th of Feb, we had our first case of COVID-19. Contact tracing was consistently done. All known cases initially were linked to overseas travel. On the 19th of March, our borders closed. There was still no evidence of community transmission. On 21st of March, there were a couple of cases where community transmission was suspected. As soon as this happened, the government introduced a four-level alert system. We were told that the alert level that we were at at that time was two, which meant that community transmission was growing. On the 23rd, the Prime Minister announced that we needed to move to level three immediately. All schools and non-essential businesses will be closed from the 24th of March and in 48 hours we would move to level 4, which meant total lockdown. A state of emergency was declared and we were informed of this via text to all our phones. Total lockdown meant only supermarkets and pharmacies were open. We could go for a walk in our local area, but not any place where, would, where we would need to drive to. I'll give you a, a little more detail now. It was, of course, an evolving, unprecedented situation. Our Prime Minister, Jacinta Ardern, and Director General of Health, Ashley Bloomfield, were on the forefront. Right from the start, they listened to all experts, they listened to all opinions, they admitted mistakes, they revised plans, worked in co cohesion, uh, tests and test centers kept increasing until the shortfall was plugged. Contact tracing continued and clusters identified. Contact tracing right now has reached a level where 80% of the tracing is done within three days. 
Now about how Jacinda and Ashley Bloomfield handled the entire situation. They explained in great detail what all the levels meant and what was expected of us. Every online forum was used to explain the four levels. It was in all the media. There were online ads, letterbox drops. Every person in New Zealand knew what it meant and what was expected. They explained in detail why they were doing what they were doing, why they were going to do what they were about to do. Jacinda used to hold live streaming chats on Facebook where any one of us that is a member of the public could ask her questions and she would answer them. Her answers were always concise, direct and crystal clear. One such Facebook chat stands out. This was her first chat and she had just put her toddler to bed. She was wearing a well-worn baggy sweatshirt, had no makeup on, and the message that she conveyed through that image was, I am one of you. It was very powerful and hard-hitting, awe-inspiring actually. Thereafter, she and Ashley Bloomfield appeared at 1 p.m. every single day to give us an update. There was total transparency and explanations were given and the communication was absolutely crystal clear. This regular com communication and the kind of communication which was a no-nonsense communication but still empathetic helped us to understand and abide by her instructions. The whole nation was with her. What was very remarkable was that the leader of the opposition party actually jumped in to help the ruling party. How many exclamation marks does that sentence deserve? The decision making has been flawless. The clarity and transparency has been grade A. The empathy is a class apart. The whole nation had no doubt that she was doing everything for the best of her people. The character of a nation is determined by how it reacts to crisis, how it treats its old, and how it treats its children. We have it all. Well, that's all from me in my New Zealand glory. But before going, I have to thank and salute of frontline workers, health workers, and even supermarket workers who have risked and continue to risk their lives to keep us going. Thank you very, very much. Kia kaha world. Kia kaha in New Zealand means stay strong. Kia kaha, my friends, and stay safe. Shahina, it was so good to hear your voice. I think after maybe a couple of decades, and thank you so much for doing this for me. From what you're telling me, it seems like in New Zealand, you have found the better of COVID-19 through the way your Prime Minister Jacinda has handled this whole situation. And it was a remarkable narrative. And it kept me wishing that we in the US got the same clarity and the same transparency and the same guidance from our political leader. But in the US, there is that void. That being said, we are at the end of our show. I want to end this show by reading to you the, the first part of the lyrics of the same song that put Captain Tom Moore on the top of the UK singles chart this week. The title of the song is You'll Never Walk Alone, and this is the way it goes. When you walk through the storm, hold your head up high and don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of the storm is a golden sky. Walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain, walk on with hope in your heart, and you'll never walk alone. I will see you again next Wednesday with the second episode of season two. Until then, be strong, be happy, be safe, and be well. <laughs>